today. Hi, I'm your host, your moderator, Alicia Richens. I myself am from Trinidad and Tobago, though I would say I live between Trinidad and Toronto these days. And I operate myself as a consultant and advocate around the sustainable development goals, helping communities and organizations make sense of them and you know, connect climate to all of our other intersecting issues. Um, so I'm gonna throw it over to Christine first to introduce herself. Thank you so much, Alicia, and I'm so excited to be here. Hi, everyone. I am Christine Samaru. I'm an intersectional feminist. I'm based in Guyana, and I'm the founder, as Alicia said, of the Breadfruit Collective, which is an organization that aims to work at the intersection of gender and environmental justice. And as you can imagine, politics play a really big role in navigating those topics and what that really means for community on the ground. Thank you, Christine. Over to you, Brittany. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you guys for joining us. It's so good to be here at the very first Climate G conference. I'm definitely super excited to be speaking with you guys. And as Alicia would have mentioned, I'm also from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the founder of Renew TNT, which started as a grassroots movement basically bringing together civil society and the public sector in promoting a sort of equilibrium between economic development and environmental policy. And it's through advocacy we'd be able to achieve those sustainable laws and policies that we so desperately need in the Caribbean. And of course, politics definitely plays a role in that. So I'm very excited to go into a deep dive into how we're sort of navigating this through our activism. And of course, looking forward to all of the wonderful contributions to come out of this plenary. Absolutely. I love that we have like the Southern Caribbean represented on the panel. Everybody in the in the chat, let us know where you're joining us from, because I'm sure we have representation from the entire region and we love to see it. So engage with us. Um, the first question we're going to start with is just like, what exactly would you say is a Gen Z or a youth approach to political activism? And what has that looked like for you two personally? Okay, so I'll go first. Um, essentially, just using my personal experience through Renew TT. So as I mentioned, um, this was essentially started as a grassroots movement, basically to promote, again, the equilibrium between development and environmental policy. And how we do that, of course, is before we can make any groundbreaking changes, we have to start small. We have to identify what are the gaps within our society and in our laws, in our policies. We also had to correct a certain level of misnomers that were spreading you know, around the world generally. People needed to be aware of what climate change was about and evidently how that affects our economy, how that affects our environment. So Renew TT and the work that I did basically started as bringing awareness and it founded in 2020, so that was like the height of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, we really try to recognize that, okay, there are certain items or there are certain issues that people were not fully aware of. And it was important for us to sort of fill those gaps. So for me, I would say an approach that, you know, Generation Z can have to political activism is first understanding that we live in a democratic society. And what that means is the rule by the people. You know, we dem democracy involves providing a certain environment that respects human rights. It also respects fundamental freedoms, which we must enjoy and in which the freely expressed will of the people is exercised. And one of the great things about activism is that it has been seen over the years as the driving force behind policy improvement, legislation, um, and that culture, I would say, more or less stemmed from America, and we're now seeing the trend towards like our islands. Um, of course, in our society, we have adopted this form of activism through, you know, labor strikes, protests, um, union movements, etc. And we're now starting to see the movement into climate justice, which is great. So, you know, activism is all about making sure that there are certain efforts to promote, um, impede, direct, or intervene in certain social and political spaces and request that political reform with the desire to make certain changes in the society. And I think um, I'm seeing more now where there's a trend for 
young people, particularly that 16 to 24 age group, where they're definitely seeing more participation in political spheres. And I think over time, we will start to see changes even in our parliamentarian system, people who are comprising of our Senate. So it's a very exciting time. And I think as this conversation continues to proliferate in many different spaces, we'll definitely see that change. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought up democracy. It reminds me of this, you know, my social studies class in standard four, where my teacher was saying, you know, the government is really all of you. Like we are the exactly. government and we just yes. have to elect like these representatives of ourselves. Correct. And we don't really Correct. play that narrative out loud in public. So I always really appreciated that to remember, like, you know what, like the government is me, the government is we. Exactly. <laughs> we we let them, we allow them to move. So, you know, we also have a certain, um, level to well we certainly have, we have a level of power to you know hold them accountable for things that are that we're not seeing in our respective society so definitely definitely and i also relate to the whole 2020 start <laughs> to all the work i think you know having people having us kind of trapped at home for lack of a better phrase it just really pushed us to i think speak more out loud online and to really get into these social media spaces and building out this kind of virtual community um in a way that maybe we were too distracted in our lives before that to jump into christine i'm so excited to hear about what you have to add Oh, I am so excited to be a part of this conversation. And I've learned so much with that, with what you have said, Brittany. And I definitely agree 100%. You know, there's that common saying, that popular saying that says the personal is political. And growing up for me in Guyana, growing up in a household that I witnessed various forms of domestic violence. And so from a very young age, like I was asking myself, like, where exactly is, um, like, why are some people able to live a life that's successful, that's healthy, and why other people's aren't? Why other people or other groups of people aren't? Why is there so much harm? Um, where exactly is the rule of law and who does it apply to? And growing up, um, studying, this has brought me to this place of like wanting to study justice because I really wanted to understand um, in a society that's recovering from colonialism. Um, we've seen even now, even in the 21st century in 2023, we see remnants of our colonial past here. We see it every day and we see it in our politics, um, in our democracy. We have a democracy here in Guyana, but sometimes I feel as though because of our history of suppressing voices, persons have a hard time of speaking up. And my work around the Breadfruit Collective regarding gender and the environment, now because of the widespread exploration of oil and gas, um, it is really important for people to know that they have a say and their voices are very, very needed and important when it comes to quote unquote development in your country. And especially when development is happening at such a rapid speed, a rapid speed. And a lot of times I must say that when you are a young person, I'm not a um I'm a proud millennial, but when you are this person speaking out, um, especially when you're a young person speaking out against the norm, against the government, it's definitely not always welcome. And part of my work with the Bright Food Collective, it's creating that community whereby you can share with other people, older and younger, creating that intergenerational space whereby you're able to like support each other in this human rights work. Because again, being vocal about your your views about right and wrong, ar around class and gender, around um, you know, the things that are happening to poor people, indigenous people, people that don't quote unquote belong to the, the high class, it can put you in positions whereby um, there is name and shame. And I personally have experienced that. And so for me, the work really surrounds equipping people with the knowledge to know that their voice and their opinion matters. They are laws and there's legislations that protect us. And so it's important for us to know these laws, one, and two, to know that there are other people um, that support, that have the same thinking, that supports you in your activism and your work that you're doing. So right now, I actually work with um, Gen Z around the ages of 16 to 23, actually, on equipping them with the skills so that they'll be able to like advocate for the things that they want. They want to see changes in society, whether it's LGBTQ rights, gender, climate, disability justice, 
whatever it may be, helping them with the skills they need um, to transform that passion into an activism. Absolutely. I really appreciate the reminder that, you know, the, the political is personal, but because it's personal doesn't mean that it's individual. It's still, you know, like we start from our personal experience and then we join together. We band together either from similar experiences or from solidarity across experiences um, to build to that collective. So folks, how do we like actually do that? Like what are examples of how we actually are able to exact change, particularly as very young people ourselves and those a little younger than us, I'm also a millennial. <laughs> well, definitely the good thing about activism is that it's constantly changing. And I've noticed that even when I started Renew TT, I had to be very creative. I had to think outside of the box and being or coming out of, pan of a pandemic, you know, you really saw the movement of social media and the reach that it had. And so I think, you know, Gen Z being that generation that is super creative and always thinking outside of the box, there are so many means and mechanisms that are out there for us young people to choose to explore and utilize for promoting a, a cause. Um, and so I would say, you know, definitely utilizing social media platforms, if it's Twitter, if it's TikTok, whatever um, platform is available for you, that definitely plays a huge role in terms of exacting change. Um, and definitely, I will also say, you know, part of my activism also is through the written work that I do as well. Um, writing blogs about certain issues that may be affecting my nation or the region on a whole. And these blogs or even academic papers, you know, reach certain types of audiences or rather new audiences. So you're putting something out there that may be new to other people. And it's also good because something that we spoke about um, while I was having a conversation with someone recently is that we really have to start changing the narrative of climate change and the issues surrounding that from a global north narrative. We don't have the um, perspectives of global south or people from the Caribbean. And you know what I really like and I'm seeing now is the fact that we have many spaces for our Caribbean youth and Caribbean people in general to promote those issues that are affecting us. And the fact that you know we're really facing the brunt of the the issues or, or the effects of climate change. So definitely through writing as well. Of course, there's always taking part in a protest. If you feel like you're somebody that's truly um, in love with advocacy and you know you want to hear your voice, you gather a group of people. I know for a fact, you know, I've seen a lot of collaborative efforts between civil society. And the good thing too is that Renew TT is always open to working with other NGOs, working with other young people who really want to get the issue out there. So, you know, having that advocacy is always a plus. Um, another thing I will probably mention too is volunteering. I know for people who generally, okay, they don't have the time to necessarily launch a campaign themselves, but they want to participate in something that an organization is doing. Of course, they can put their time towards working on a project or a conservation work or a bit a beach cleanup. Or perhaps your community center may be engaging in, in some sort of activity that you really enjoy. Of course, those are also other things that you can use to exact change. Um, for me personally, and I think this will touch specifically on this topic as well, is back to the whole point of democracy and understanding that we as people have the power to exact the change that we want to see from our political representatives. Definitely, definitely, definitely use the opportunities that you have to speak to your political representatives. I have reached out to the counselor that is in charge of my area. I sent him proposals on things that I wanna see in my community. And I think this is definitely a good way of getting to know who is representing you. Because the thing about it is people often think that, okay, politicians may not necessarily want to speak to me, but sometimes we literally have to go to them. And that's just how it is sometimes. You know, We have to find the courage and be bold and just, go with our issues. Um, and that's definitely something that I think will be helpful because as more people 
start to get involved, they will actually start to feel like, okay, I'm actually seeing certain change. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, as I said, and I think politicians or political representatives, counselors also need to know exactly what is going on. Because one of the things I face as well is realizing that I also have to teach certain delegates and diplomats about issues that are affecting us. They don't always necessarily know. So it's a good bonding experience, being able to speak to them, let them know about certain proposals or things that you can see will work or benefit your community definitely is a plus. And the last thing, as I mentioned earlier as well, is giving young people, other young people a role. And one of those, one of the things that I particularly enjoy about being in the climate space is that there's always room for inspiration and you can make a difference um, by inspiring others to join your movement or to join literally the climate space and the climate justice movement. It's not only just about you teaching other young people about important issues, but you're also encouraging them to teach others too. And it's always a plus to have a, a teaching moment, you know, outside of the classroom, we can literally learn anywhere. And even through this conference, everyone is getting the opportunity to learn. And it also ties back to, you know, the whole idea of access to information, access to justice. Like, it's at our fingertips once we collaborate, once we give everyone the opportunity to launch their campaigns, raise awareness on issues affecting them, then we can definitely see that change. Absolutely. That reminds me of, you know, one of the tenets of the, the authors of this book, All We Can Save. They say, you know, like one of the most powerful things you can do in terms of climate action is just talking to people, like having more conversations, whether that's just with your family, with your friends, reaching out to your representatives, because at the end of the day, they rely on you to keep their job. So they're not really, they can't really shut you down that hard, you know? It's really not that hard, even though we tend to feel intimidated by their, you know, prestige and their status and their age um, above us. What other examples come to mind, Christine? Yes, I love all the nuggets, the cool nuggets that Brittany has shared, and I definitely relate to it so much because there's so many ways to be an activist. There are so many ways to show that you care about an issue. And just to add on to what she said, I would say this idea of having intergenerational dialogue and intergenerational partnership, I think is really necessary and important because there are many people, there are many people who have paved the way for us. And it's important for us to understand the work that they have done, honor the work that they have done, and also uh, include them in the work um, because it's it's um it's a marathon. We're going at it and we want to acknowledge the things that they've done. And at the same time, we have to also, I mentioned before the mentorship program um, that I'm I am implementing here in Guyana, but other mentorship program like Girls Care that I'm a part of, the importance of giving young activists the tools they need to navigate um, a world that continues to violate our rights. So it's really necessary to bridge that too, um, bridge the connection between indigenous people, bridge the connection and make, you know, make space for people with disability, um, LGBTQ people, because the issues that we face when it comes to climate change, it just amplifies all these social justice issues. So it's necessary when we're having conversation, when we're having campaigns, when we're designing our programs and projects that we're getting voices from people that don't look like us, that don't think like us. Mm -hmm. um, that way we can expand our horizon because what we're doing is we're creating movements, we're movement builders, we're change makers. And it's necessary for us to create a movement that doesn't look like the past. Because when you look back at the past, what you find is so many people have been marginalized because of certain movements or certain um, things that were supposed to um, benefit, quote unquote, groups of persons. But when you look back at it, you find that there are groups of people that were left behind. And we are at a point in our climate crisis, a climate emergency, whereby we can't make those mistakes. And it's necessary for us as young activists to understand the importance of bridging those connections between older people, younger people, um, you know, people that that are part of this movement in a way that understands it that might be different from us. For example, our indigenous people here in Guyana, they work closely with the land. The Amazon rainforest that we have, our portion is intact because of the livelihood and the way they live because of their livelihood. It doesn't always mean you have to be the most educated person in the room to have a climate solution. 
So I think environmental activism, climate activism can take many forms. And bringing it back to my activism, sometimes it does also mean going on the, going on the streets and protesting and picketing and being loud and, you know, because sometimes that's where you have to be when you're, when you're fighting against cooperation and large groups of people with more power than you, you have to mobilize the masses of people. Because like you rightfully said in the beginning, we elect our government to serve us. We are in power, but sometimes something along the way, sometimes along the way, we forget that, um, you know, we, we start to think of them as as these god and goddesses that they're too high for us to reach. But in reality, we are the one that elect them. They're supposed to serve us and they're supposed to serve us and the environment to the best of their ability. In our rights, um, in our law in Guyana, in our environmental act, it speaks to citizens having a healthy environment. So you go back to, to those things, those legislations that politicians sign on to easily. You go back to what they sign on to, what they say they'll provide. And that's one aspect of, you know, navigating politics and understanding that the law can also be used for you. Um, and you should continue to go back to the law because it is there is a lot of value in that. Absolutely. I know sometimes we get frustrated because we do have some of those laws that we could really throw out, but there are lots in there that are useful and can still, you know, support our journeys towards move moves towards act um climate act, climate action and climate justice in our societies. So we have the first question in the Q&A from Derval, and she wants to know how do you achieve balance in your activism, considering the less than ideal conditions and systems that we exist in? How do we remain optimistic yet realistic? That's a big one. So take a second. <laughs> Thank you so much, Derval, for joining. And I love that question. And I, I think um, for me, when I was growing up, I, I've never seen people in you know, achieve like uh, college education. And so for navigating this world, I've always felt like I'm the only person navigating it, um, kind of like you're doing it by your trial and then whatever happens, happens. And I realized this climate movement and this climate activism, the importance of your community. Your community doesn't always have to mean where you live, but the importance of being with your community, being with those people that ground you and involving them in your work. And I think for me, even in the book that you mentioned, All We Can Save, there, there is so much, um, th th when you go back to storytelling, there's so much inspiration that comes from that. And I always tell people that even on a damaged planet, even on a planet that experienced so much um destruction it still provides for all our needs all the water that we drink the food that we eat the air that we breathe it's still providing for us it's still loving us in in a way that it knows how and so how can you not be grateful for it so i think um in my activism as much as i get upset with my government and i always tell people i can love my i can love my country to you know, I love it deeply and I can still find issues with my politician. I go back to the inspiration from my community, from my family, from the people that are doing this work um, day in and day out. I mentioned before the climate activists and human rights activists that have been doing this um, for years and years and they all hold inspiration. So finding your inspiration is really necessary in keeping you going because this movement can be daunting. And especially when you're doing the work as someone in the Caribbean and you're doing the work from the grassroots, um, you're doing it with community, but you're not always getting, you know, you're not always being represented or acknowledged. Um, sometimes going back to why you started why, why is it that you care? And for me, why I care, I always go back to where I started being the one for my family to achieve this, this high level of education. And that's inspiration in itself. Love that. It's like really grounding ourselves in that inspiration and then connecting that back to the, the actions that we're getting into and finding that balance because you know, it's often said that, you know, those of us who criticize our governments, the worst, like it's, it comes from a place of love. It comes from a place of like deep care and concern. It's not, it's not from a place of hate. And it's definitely not from a place of disinterest or apathy. Um, so yeah, I really, I really love that takeaway. Brittany, what about you? 
I couldn't agree more definitely with what Christine said. And I think, you know, you really do have to go back to where you started and remember why you began this movement in the first place. And again, the good thing about this space is that there are many other people who are going through the same sort of emotions with you. We all experience that climate anxiety. We're always worrying about our future and, you know, the people that basically hold our future in their hands. And so, you know, looking at it from the perspective of, okay, I am trying to carry on this movement, but there are so many things that are also coming in my way of that, whether it be political influence or just work. You know, um, I'm also an attorney at law and sometimes law in itself could become so overwhelming that you just tend to forget everything that you've been working so hard towards. But the good thing about it too is that being in a space like that, you also have the opportunity to exact change. And one of the things that I definitely want to leave with everyone is the fact that sometimes it's about not comparing yourself to where someone else may be, but just trust in like your own process and your trajectory, whatever you may be in, um, whether it's in the creative industry or technology, or you may be in law like me, there are always a number of opportunities for you to exact change and be able to like pinpoint certain gaps and then bring it back home to the climate movement. So, you know, definitely it's a balancing act. It doesn't get easy. Um, it's definitely not glamorous, but, you know, you try to put your best foot forward each and every day. Absolutely. And always remembering that we are still humans, we're not machines. So that, that need for self-care and community care has to be grounded into that this process that we don't, you know, become burnt out on the way there. Uh, we have a question from Chrisanne who's asked, well, we have two questions. So number one, what do you think needs to be done to improve climate activism and break past political differences and borders in the Caribbean? So maybe let's start with the first question first. I love that question. Thank you so much. I think um, in Guyana, growing up again, it's all you've always faced with this this um, idea of you have to be this good person, this good child in school, and politics doesn't always fit into that that mold of being a good child. How dare you speak up? And I think conferences like this that are aiming to mold young people that they're able to see for themselves, like people in their region are taking action in their community, little action, big action um, for the environment and also connecting back to that intersectional approach whereby we get to a point where we, we start to interrogate colonialism and capitalism and the patriarchy. I think that's what's needed. This continuous conversation that happens that are that, that we've seen happening over and over. Uh, we need to see it happen because like we mentioned throughout this conference, listening to the speakers, a lot of times we're influenced by you know, by the West, we're influenced by North America, by Europe, but it's important. And the, the saying, it's so true, representation matters. It's important for us to see people like ourselves speaking out and representing in a way that would, you know, touch us and say to ourselves, like, you know what, I can be that person or similar to that person, I can do this thing in my community. Similar to that person, the things that I'm thinking about doesn't seem silly. The ideas that I have actually make sense because I'm hearing this person share their story of how they have overcome it. And when you share lived experience, like we've been doing in this conference, is like the storytelling aspect. It really touched people in a way that I don't think any, like a lecture would. It's important for us to see ourselves represented and also also building that network. And again, spaces like on social media, um, conferences like this, it's it's good because it provides that networking space for us um, to hear about what's happening in our region, to learn about solutions, because it's not always doom and gloom. There's so many people, so many young people also that's doing the work, that's doing the work in addition to their daily day-to-day -day work. And it's necessary for us to like acknowledge that people are in doing the things in the region um, to make our space better because we are in a space that's extremely vulnerable to the climate climate impacts. And at the same time, there are still people that are taking on that role to say, you know what, it's important for me to lead, even though I may not know what leadership looks like or I may not know exactly where, what the outcome might be, I'm still going to attempt to try and do this thing. 
Love that. What about you, Brittany? Yeah, just adding on to what Christine said, I think something that's definitely needed, at least for in our region, is breaking down that taboo that activism means creating chaos or public disorder. I think sometimes, and what I've noticed from dialogue again, is that people tend to confuse the two. And that is why speaking about these things are so important. Understanding that, again, as people, we have our fundamental freedoms that are guaranteed by our constitutions. We have laws that are supposed to be in place to protect us, um, but yet we still feel disenfranchised or we still feel like it's not doing enough for us. And that is where the activism really becomes important because we have to take a stance as people to intervene and say, hey, you know, this system is not working or this system has a gap and we need to try and fill that in. So having that dialogue, and I think that will sort of bridge, you know, climate activism and the political indifferences. It goes back to what I was saying before about really creating the space to speak with political representatives or your counselors, whoever would be, you know, someone that you can reach out to easily because dialogue is very important. It helps for people to understand, okay, why are people getting so worked up about climate change? Why are people so concerned about, you know, access to justice? And, and where is it that it all went wrong? You know, we have to understand that being in a politically charged society does not always mean that we will obtain certain rights. And, you know, we have to, there's a certain level of entitlement, of course, that people have, which is expected because you expect people that are in charge of a society to work for you. But sometimes it doesn't always work that way because of lack of resources or some other issue. So where you have the opportunity to literally find a common ground, find those solutions, then I definitely feel we can start breaking past some of those challenges and borders. Yeah, I love that both of you touched on this idea of misbehavior, you know, and it's one of these colonial things that we have, like, oh, well, there are yes, these it's so old and we have school. to follow the rules and we can't question if the rules are good rules or bad rules and actually maybe being a good person is breaking the rules and misbehaving a little bit because that's actually going to serve us all in the end. Um, so, Brittany, I'm going to throw this one to you as our resident lawyer first. So do you think <laughs> sure. that laws are proving to be or not to be in favor of climate activism? Do some laws need to be amended? Absolutely. 100% our laws need to be amended. Definitely. I think, um, again, it kind of just goes back to our history of colonialism and more or less the post-independence era. We have used what our you know, UK has operated to use in our countries as like the, the rule of thumb. But the thing about it is, is that sometimes we can't always just copy and paste certain systems into what our society really needs. And definitely like if anyone is to like go and check our legislation online, the laws are super outdated. You can definitely tell like what happened or was passed in 1968 is definitely not pertinent to 2023. So 100% our laws need to be amended. And I think this is where, again, climate activism plays a huge role. Now, as Christine and I mentioned earlier, climate activism is beyond just rioting in the streets or having a, prote a protest, sorry, but it's also about writing about, you know, certain laws that are in place. You may be reading through your constitution and realize, wait a minute, I don't have a right to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment. Trinidad and Tobago definitely does not have one enshrined in their constitution. And that's something that people have been realizing for some time that our constitutions, which are supposed to be the foundation of a democratic society, is actually very much outdated and we need to get that reform. Um, as well as, you know, just other laws that may be in place. Sometimes we don't even have laws to necessarily regulate certain vehicles that drive in our, in, on our roads. Um, laws with respect to waste management, laws in respect to recycling. Um, depending on which sector you're at, maybe you may be working on a project that is dealing with conservation. And one of the segments of that project is ensuring that you know we put together some sort of draft model legislation or draft model policy 
it always kind of goes back to making some proposition or proposal to the people that are the executing agencies to put forward that change. So activism is, is such a beautiful thing. And I think, you know, we, we have the opportunity to be creative, as I said before, using the means and mechanisms that are available to us. And for sure, you know, once we have all the right people on board, you know, we have somebody with the legal mind, somebody with the scientific background, we can definitely start seeing those changes in our legal and policy frameworks. So well said. Christine, would you like to have anything to add there? What's going on with our legal systems and legislatures? I love that. And I love that you said that activism can be such a beautiful thing. And I think I'm going to write that on a little like sticky note and stick it somewhere to remind myself because being an activist, you know, this is the this is the rent we pay to live on this planet. The all the the things that we enjoy, someone had to fight for it. Like thinking about the weekend, we're able to like be at home relaxing, but someone fought fought for that, you know. And when I think of laws and legislation, you know, I my work is also centered on the gender space, and a part of that gender work has to do with gender based violence. And what I see from the gender laws that we signed on to as Guyanese, um, from a legislative legislation point of view, we have done extremely well. Whatever the legislation is, we've signed on to it. But when it comes down to implementation, because day after day, you would still find um, this person being harmed by or even killed by their domestic partner, by the intimate partner. And you find you, you question yourself, like, why do we have all these laws? And yet these violence is still happening. You have traffic um, accidents on the road so often, but yet you have traffic laws. And I, I want to say that it goes back to enforcement as well. And in enforcement, um, yes, when people are not doing what they need to do, but enforcement of the law, letting people know what the law are, what their rights are. And I think of our abortion legislation in Guyana, abortion is 100% legalized, but not a lot of people know about that, not even in the country, not even in the Caribbean know that that's a, legis that's a piece of legislation that we have it as Guyanese, that's our piece of legislation. We have bodily autonomy. And because you don't know your rights, we find that there's a lot of shame there's a lot of um, doctors taking advantage of people and, again, using um, religious um, aspect to, you know, shame people like this is the wrong thing you're doing. You're breaking a law when, in fact, it's actually 100 percent legal. So when I think of the law, I think of it as in the enforcement aspect. I think of um, people knowing the rights. Who are the people that know their rights? Everyone should be able to know their rights, not only the police officers knowing what the laws are and when to punish you when you break the law, but thinking about community members, thinking about children in school, um, giving them the space to be able to like question those laws and creating a society. When you think of the society of the future, um, are we creating a society whereby we are allowing people to like question us, um, those in power, or are we suppressing them? Because it's necessary for us to equip our, our next, the next generation with all the tools they need. And for them to like get all the tools, they will have to question the one that we have in place currently. Absolutely. I can sit here and dive into these themes with y'all all day long, but I'm getting this signal to wrap up soon. <laughs> So what I'd like to do for our wrap up, you know, you both touched so beautifully and eloquently on, you know, making sure that we all ground ourselves in our why um, and that that inspiration moving forward in your action. So just to close us out, remind us like what was personally for each of you, your motivation to get politically engaged and what words of motivation do you have for Gen Z themselves to also join you or join us, I should say. Yes, that's a really excellent question. Thank you, Alicia. Um, there was actually a mantra that I had seen, and it always actually, funny enough, like recurs every time, like when Renew TT more or less hits like an anniversary date. And that mantra is, leave every place better than you found it. And that is something that I think a lot of people can utilize as their um motivational factor even though I would say you know try not to be driven by motivation but just have something that will inspire you to keep on moving forward um 
definitely it's something that is the driving force behind you know our efforts and our activism to innovate solutions in this world and we have the opportunity each and every day to inspire change. The thing about activism is that you will not always see groundbreaking changes overnight. Sometimes it takes years on years. Sometimes it takes building a solid foundation before you can actually start seeing things really rolling forward. But the fact of the matter is, is that you're able to delve into a discussion with someone who never heard about climate change, who never knew about the laws that we had in our regions and what really seems to be like the socioeconomic issues that are facing us as people. And so I think that in itself is definitely something that you can always carry forward as like a torch to, to say that, okay, there's always an opportunity for um, a lesson to be learned. There's always an opportunity for mentorship and building um, a sort of like collaborative effort. Um, and I think, you know, we all have a role to play generally in safeguarding our planet or safeguarding our nation. And it's about finding your role. I think as young people, again, going back to the anxiety of what really is my purpose? What it, would my future look like? It also involves a, a, an introspection of yourself and, and who you see yourself as being. And I know for me, you know, I, I always consider myself to be innovative, but also more to just curious. I always had this knack for wanting to learn more. And because of that, you know, that really translated into everything that I did, whether it's legal advocacy or diplomacy or just engaging in a project or volunteerism. So using the skills that you have, that you've been equipped with through education or outside of education and honing in on those th those skills, I think is definitely very important. And, you know, together we can build a cleaner, greener future for generations to come. Beautiful. I don't, I don't want to mar that by saying anything else. Over to you, Christine. Uh, I can't believe our time has um, come to an end, but I just want to say thank you to both of you and Brittany. I am so I'm so pleased to be on a um, panel with you. Likewise. And I would say when it comes to this work, it's important for us not to be passive, not to be neutral. We can't be neutral in this situation of injustice. We have to um, be vigilant, and we have to be. We have to be alert, mm -hmm. and we have to know our history as well. Because when you go back in your history. Um, going back to my own Guyanese history, but also my own Caribbean history, we would see there's so much um, resilient, there's so much power, there's so many, um, there's so many times when our own people were resilient and resistant and also um, fought against the power. And a lot of times we don't learn this, we don't learn about this in our classroom, and we know why we don't learn about it in our classroom, but it's up to us to continue to um remind ourselves of our history, remind ourselves of how our people came to this land, why they came to this land, because we are people that came from enslavement, from indentured servitude. And so it's necessary for us to reflect on the work that our ancestors have done and remind ourselves that it's important that you can still love your country and you can still criticize it because you know the importance and what it can become. And as a young leader, I would also say that people are looking at you. People are always looking at you for inspiration. You may not know them. They may not say it out loud, but they're looking at you. And so it's important for you to lead and be inspiring and for you to like involve people in the, in the same way people have involved you. Make sure that when you climb that staircase, you're taking people with you so you can continue on this movement. And the last thing I would say is... Um, a better future exists and a better future is possible. A greener future exists, a sustainable future, a radical future exists, a future that centers uh, marginalized voices like people with disability, LGBTQ. Um, it exists because we have the knowledge of our indigenous people. We have the knowledge of our youth. We have people that are doing this work right in our in our region, in our country. So I think that it's important for us to also think about and reimagine the future that we want because it is possible. And what I find is and what research has shown us is when we center the environment, when we center um, climate action, issues like gender-based violence, 
issues like domestic violence, um, overall, like interpersonal violence, it goes down because you're centering um, the environment to be a place that is welcoming to everybody. So I'll end with that. <laughs> Absolutely. The environment oh, is sad. everything. Ground ourselves in that inspiration. Keep keeping on, you know, find, find our avenues for activism. It's all so wonderful. Thank you both so much. I've learned so much from you. I look forward to keeping in touch with you. I really appreciate, you know, I hope the audience is also feeling this fire under us to get going now. Thanks to the two of you. So now folks, we have a 13 minute break. You can stretch, you can go grab a snack, run to the bathroom, get your water, organize your notes on your questions because at 2 p.m. we have the mini career affair expo on life beyond activism. See you soon. You'll have a great day. Bye everyone. Thank you so much.